you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to Big Circus Ten the Sky, folks. The most brilliant podcast assembled for the greatest audience ever assembled. Don't man. Or at least the audience of the Chris Voss Show. One of those two. <laughs> Flies. Or both. I don't know. You can run with it any way you want. Anyway, it's wonderful to have you on the show as well. Uh, check out our recent releases. We recently uh, interviewed another billionaire on the show. And also our coverage of South by Southwest event. We just published those over the weekend. Uh, South by Southwest 2023. And uh, check out some of the amazing entrepreneurs and innovations we reviewed there. Uh, today, we have a returning guest. He's been on the show before for his amazing historical books he's pretty prolific on everything he does and what he puts out and he's written a new book called the collaborators three stories of deception and survival in world war ii just came out march 7th 2023 ian bruma is on the show with us today and he'll be talking to us about his latest historical book and everything that goes into it i'm pretty excited to learn about this because uh, the more you learn about history the more you can uh, change history for the future ian was born in the netherlands he studied chinese at uh Lenin university or Leiden university and cinema at uh, Nihon University. Am I getting any of these names correct, uh, Ian? Yeah, more or less. More or less. There you go. Uh, he has lived and worked in Tokyo, Hong Kong, London, and New York. And he is a regular contributor to Harper's and The New Yorker and writes monthly columns for Project Syndicate and Bloomberg. He's a professor at Bard College and lives in New York City. Welcome again to the show, Ian. How are you? Very well, thank you. Great. Awesome sauce. Uh, give us a .com or wherever you want people to find you, get to know you better on those interweb, which is in the sky. I'm sorry. I didn't quite quite hear your question. Uh, if you could give us a .com or wherever you want people to find you on the internet. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, uh, Baruma, B-U-R-U-M-A, at Bard, B-A-R-D, dot com. There you go. So what motivated you to write this latest book? Well, the, I was interested in these three characters, and I'd known about them for quite a while. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they're fairly well known in, in different uh, parts of the world. Um, and I've also been interested in, in the idea of, the, of collaborators and collaboration with, um, with bad governments or country, countries under occupation. I was born in December 1951 in the Netherlands, as you mentioned, and uh, Holland had been occupied by Nazi Germany uh, during the war. And so I grew up very much in the shadow of that war. Mm. And when I grew up, the myths um, were that, you know, every teacher at school had been a brave resistor and so on. And we knew that we couldn't go buy candy in a certain store because the woman who owned it had had a German boyfriend. So mm. the distinction between good and bad was very clear. And later, we realized that things were not quite so clear-cut. And I, 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 I find it, in, in some ways, more interesting uh, to figure out why people fall for the temptation of collaborating, doing something bad, than to be a hero. There you go. And, uh, you know, we had you on the show for, I think it was the Churchill Complex, That's uh, your book. And you've written a lot of books about history. How many books do you have in your library so people oh, can I, I have no idea. I've never counted them. <laughs> there are quite a lot. I couldn't count them either. So. I, I, I need to get rid of them. I don't have space. Oh, there you go. Well, Amazon evidently has plenty of space. There's uh, 41 titles according to them, so people can go there and order your other stuff as well. Uh, so the collaborators, are these villains in history then? Are they good guys? Uh, in, in, uh... Well, in a way they're, well, they're certainly they cooperated with villainous uh, mm. regimes. Mm -hmm. um, whether they're personally completely villainous or not is is a harder question to answer because most human beings uh, not a hundred percent bad and not a hundred percent good. It's a spectrum. Some people are worse than others, that's for sure. And so the choices they made uh, were certainly bad. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but simply to condemn people as villains doesn't make them very more interesting, and it doesn't al- allow the reader or, or indeed the writer uh, to come to a greater understanding. There you go. There you go. So uh, give us an overview, a 30,000-foot overview of uh, who these folks were and uh, what's inside the book. Well, one of them was um, Himmler's Masseur. And he was born in Estonia. He had a Finnish passport and he had magic hands. And he massaged the, the, the rich and famous before the war, mostly in Germany, but really all over Europe. Mm-hmm. And um, Himmler had terrible stomach cramps. Himmler was, of course, the head of the SS. And um, Kersten, that was his name, Felix Kersten, was the only one who knew how to relieve his pain. And so Himmler made him into his personal masseur. Mm. Kerstin later claimed that this was against his own will and so on. Not so likely. I think he liked, he was a sort of natural servant to the the rich and powerful. He liked Mm. being close to power. He liked being a man of consequence, of influence and so on. And um, after the war, um, he he wanted to once again become the master of the rich and famous, but having been Himmler's personal master was not the best calling card. So he embellished his war record and claimed that he'd been a great resistor. Now, some of that Ah. was uh, true in the sense that he sometimes um, asked Himmler to release people from concentration camps in exchange for relieving him of his pain. And at the end of the war, Himmler was trying to make a deal with the Allies and was even prepared to release some Jews from camps. And Kerstin played a kind of role as a middleman. But after the war, he, he embellished this and... Uh, he had been much closer to the Nazis than he claimed. The second person was a very different, but also somebody who wanted to be important and cleverer than everybody else and well-connected and so on. And he was a Jewish immigrant from Lwów, or now Lviv in Ukraine, then Poland, in Holland, and was son of an assimilated secular Jewish family, and to rebel against his parents, he became ultra-Orthodox, a Hasid. And um, he was a con man. Um, And he, when Holland was under occupation and the Jews began to be deported to the death camps, he claimed to have lists, and then in exchange for payment to Friedrich Weinreb, that was his name, you could get on his list and, and he promised that you would be uh, on the train to safety in Switzerland and Portugal and, or, or Spain, and the list would be backed by a German general. In fact, the list was completely made up. There was no such thing, mm. nor, did, nor did such a general exist. It all came from his imagination. And wow. he too um, had a checkered career. He was arrested by the Germans, then released, probably cooperated with the Germans, betrayed people, ended up having to go into hiding himself, survived the war, was tried as a fraudster and a traitor after the war, um, spent a few years in jail, but then in the 60s became a kind of counterculture hero, and he was taken up by the the, the sort of student rebellions that were taking place in Holland just as they were everywhere else, and he became a kind of hero who resisted the establishment quite wrongly. This was a myth, but in any mm-hmm. case, that was his role after the war. Third person... Um, was a Manchu princess, so born in China, um, at the time of the revolution when the Qing dynasty, which was was, was, was a Manchu dynasty of the Manchu um, aristocracy, uh, fell, and she was adopted by an ultra-nationalist in Japan. And she collaborated with the Japanese, hoping that the Manchu, that the Qing dynasty would be revived. She was also a cross-dresser. She had bad experiences with men and sort of dressed up in male uniforms and became a legend during the war in Japan. There were fictional biographies of her life. There were movies about her. He was arrested um, uh, by the Chinese after the war um, as a traitor and executed. And one of the oddities of the trials that they used a lot of those things that were made up about her with her own uh, connivance during the war against her as evidence. So what ties them all together is that they all used extreme circumstances of war and occupation to play roles that were bigger than they really were. Uh, and they were fantasists. They were, they were the authors of their own creators of their own myths. 
There you go. So this is an interesting story. Did did the three of them collaborate with each other at all, or they no, just collaborate they, they with the enemy? They wouldn't even know of each other's existence. There you go. There you go. And, and what made you, the three of these stand out to you and, and the reason you chose them? Well, one of the things, as I said, that they had in common was this uh, tendency to, to make themselves up. I mean, mm. extreme circumstances, and even when they're not so extreme, I mean, take the, the four years under Donald Trump, when truth goes out of the, wi out the window, mm. and people can start making up whatever they like. Mm -hmm. um, being under a, a foreign occupation, being living in a dictatorship and so on, collaboration, of course, allows you to do that. It allows mm. you to, it allows second rate, third rate novelists uh, doctors who've been struck off for uh, uh, um, uh, acting against the rules of medicine, um, failed polit politicians and so on, they have their chance to reinvent themselves. Mm. And um, uh, so the Trump years in some ways, uh, although I don't refer to it directly anywhere in this book, but it were um, a spur to, to write about people who were who, who, uh, well, the authors of their own fake news, if you want to put it that way. There you go. There you go. Interesting characters uh, that are uh, from real life. Um, so what kind of research did you put into it? How hard was it to track these guys down, understand them, uh, and, and find out the history that went behind them? Well, you obviously couldn't interview them, um, and not many people who knew them are still alive. Mm. But they wrote. Uh, they all wrote memoirs. Um, mm. Um, not reliable ones. <laughs> Other people have written about them, uh, also not always reliable. So in a way, the book is not only about trying to find out what actually happened. It's also mm. a, a, a way to describe storytelling. I mean, wh what people make up and why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I identify as a plant, uh, as a, I think a palm tree. I think of that. Well, then as, you are a palm tree. I am a palm if tree. If that's the yeah. way you feel, then you have the. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think some people in my audience might think that. Uh, that dude's a tree. So clearly he's faking being Chris Voss. Uh, we all know that's probably true. Um, so this is really interesting. And the stories that go into them. Uh, and then did they all play the part where they were all collaborators with the enemy? And then when uh, the war was over, or you're rounding up and it looked like things were going to go bad for collaborators, they, they changed their tune? Yes, certainly Himmler's Massa did. I mean, mm -hmm. he made all kinds of crazy claims that he'd, in exchange for relieving Himmler's pain, he stopped him from deporting the entire Dutch population to Poland mm -hmm. and so on, which certainly could never have happened. Um, uh, in the case of the Hasidic con man, uh, of course, he maintained he'd been a brave resistor and that he uh, and, and all those who wanted to accuse him were really anti-Semites. Wow. Uh, in the case of, of uh, poor old uh, Kawashima Yoshiko, the, um, which was the Japanese name for this Chinese Manchu lady, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have much time to make anything up because um, she was quite swiftly tried and executed. Oh, wow. There you go. They, they, didn't, take a, they didn't take anything uh, out of that. You know, the, the uh, story of the Jewish gentleman uh, is interesting because he cost people, well, I guess they all cost people lives when it came down to it. Correct? Uh, hard to tell about all of them. I mean, the master oh, really? itself did not, was not responsible for anybody dying. I mean, he, he was responsible for making uh, the life of a mass murderer more comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't really say that he actually was responsible for the murder of anybody. Oh. Um, Weinreb, the, the Hasidic con man, certainly was. I mean, he did betray uh, a number of people. We'll probably never know quite how many uh, who ended up in death camps and dying. Um, in the case of Kawashi Mayoshiko, again, the, 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 it's so hard to separate myth from reality. You're not, you can never quite be sure. But she did play a role in military operations and spying and so on uh, for the Japanese in China that she probably did have some blood on her hands. But how, how, how much her hands were covered in blood uh, is very, it's, it's hard to tell. There you go. Did, w did any of this involve money, or was it just uh, it was ascension to want to be around power? And uh... Uh, it, it, it did involve money. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly involved power. 
Um, Vinereb, the, the fraudster, took money, of course, from people mm. to be on those imaginary lists and made quite a lot of money out of it. Um, uh, uh, Himmler's master, Kersten, was certainly well paid. Um, I don't think the, there was a huge amount of money. I mean, the, the, the Kawashi Mayoshiko certainly took money from Japanese military officers and so on, but I don't think she enriched herself. Mm -hmm. She lived comfortably. But money probably wasn't the main objective of any of these three. I think mm -hmm. they wanted to be, they were, they were insecure people mm -hmm. um, who were all children of collapsing empires, mm -hmm. who were not entirely sure where they belonged, and um, wanted to be important, wanted mm -hmm. to be uh, near power, wanted to um, play a role on the big stage. And I think that was probably more important to them than simply uh, getting money. If, if money were the only objective, it would, it would have been much less interesting as a study of, of character. Would you frame them as narcissists yes. in their chase for the thing? So yes. I think, I think all self-invented characters who make up stories about themselves and so on are, are narcissists. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, they have to create that facade of, of ego and and uh, success and, and everything else. Uh, so, did did they come from broken childhoods? Was a, did you find there was any sort of instigator in their upbringing? I think that well, um, Kawashima Yoshiko, the, the, the Manchu, um, certainly came from a broken childhood. I mean, her, her, her father more or less gave her up uh, for adoption to this wow. ultra-nationalist uh, man in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, she was probably abused by her stepfather and also by uh, had, had unpleasant experiences with other men, which mm -hmm. may, may have been one of the reasons she decided she was going to be the Oriental, as she put it, the Oriental Joan of Arc and dress up as a man and so on and so forth. So she certainly had a very unfortunate childhood. I'm not sure in the case of the Masser, his childhood accounted for anything he, he, he later did. There you go. There you go. So it's interesting you pick this three these three people out of history, and uh, what do you hope readers come away from when they read the book and and uh, and learn about these three individuals? Well, I I'm not the kind of writer who who writes a book to give people one message or a takeaway mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, there are various things you try and achieve, or you hope that the reader gets out of them. One is they're good stories. Yeah. Uh, you learn something about these characters and therefore about human nature. And at the same time, you learn something about the history they lived through. So um, I think all those uh, things uh, and also the dangers of letting go of the idea that truth matters. I think if there's anything um, uh, that I, I try to stress, it, it, it's that, that truth does matter, that it's not relative, mm. that um, you can't just make things up unless you're doing it deliberately as a work of art. I mean, that's a, another thing, of course. Sure. Yeah. You're just making art at that point. Um, you know, do you see parallels between their stories and the villainous uh, aspect and narcissism and, and, and sometimes evil uh, with, you know, like, for example, what's going on today with the, U the Ukraine war? I mean, we have one man who's decided to just muck up the whole world because he's, I don't know, he's either delusional or, or, cancer ridden or health ridden or at the end of his days and he's decided to go out with a bang um do you see any parallels between that yes, and I, what I we can learn various, from history? yeah i see various parallels one is the, the the how difficult it or how many gray areas there are when it comes to collaboration mm -hmm. and uh, i remember a piece i think in the new yorker not so long ago which was fascinating about collaboration in ukraine and mm -hmm. so you have a, a, a town in the Ukraine that gets taken over by the Russian by the Russian army, and then there are people who decide it's necessary to collaborate with the Russians in order to feed people, for example. And they're not not necessarily because they're on the Russian side at all, but the people still need to be fed. Life goes on. Survival. The Ukrainians take the car, the town back, and these people are then often arrested as wicked collaborators. Well, there mm -hmm. becomes very complicated. So I think there is a parallel. Uh, there. Um, the other parallel, well, the other thing that I think plays a role in it without exaggerating uh, um, comparisons 
um, are, again, I think one of the, the aspects of the Trump years, and I'm not comparing Trump to Hitler or saying it was a dictatorship or that they were Nazis or anything of that sort, uh, far from it. But one of the things you did see is that all kinds of weirdos and third raters and, and bitter failures and so on suddenly saw their main chance mm -hmm. and started and, and, and took up rather senior positions in, in the American government where, I mean, they wouldn't have had a chance in, uh, under normal, more normal circumstances. So there is a parallel there, too. Yeah, you're, I mean, you're watching them all be prosecuted right now, and uh, I, there was another attorney recently who was censured, uh, who was one of the ones up telling lies, and yeah, at the end, it became very pirate, it seemed like a pirate ship from the beginning, but uh, it became a real, a real uh, shit show at the end with mm -hmm. the thing, and it, and the reason I like these stories, the reason I like having historians and authors like yourself on who tell these stories is it, it's the one thing that I always say. The one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. Mm -hmm. And thereby we go round and round. And yes. until we really understand our history, the patterns of human nature, how we do things. And it's just astounding to me that we've, you know, been on the earth for eons of time, however you want to measure it. Um, and we still can't get this right. You know, we seem to have had every, I don't know, 40 or 50 years go through the same sort of thing. You know, no one thought we'd have another sort of war that could uh, possibly escalate into a world war. Um, and yet here we are. Well, and we'll never get it right, I'm afraid. I mean, because mm -hmm. of uh, human frailty. I mean, maybe I'm a, I'm a bit older than you are. I don't know. But my generation has simply been very fortunate, at least mm -hmm. if you were living in in, in, in relatively free and relatively well-off countries mm -hmm. in that we've lived much of our lives in a, in a, in a period of, of peace and security. Mm -hmm. but that's very rare in history. And I'm, I'm not very optimistic that simply by knowing history, we won't repeat the same mistakes. I mean, you can mm -hmm. l learn a lot about history, but also learn the wrong lessons. And it's not going to prevent us from uh, making mistakes, which are never exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But um, what, nonetheless, it's very important to know history because it, it allows you to understand uh, the world you live in better. I mean, without history, it's uh, if you don't know any history, then it looks as though every day is brand new. I mean, every day is brand new in one sense, but, but everything that happens has never happened before. You have to know about history in order to realize that that is not not the case. I guess I'll be saying my axiom forever. Then <laughs> the one thing man can learn from his history is he never learns from his history. It'll just keep it'll just keep on rolling. I'll be using that fifty years from now if I'm still alive. I'm afraid so. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've you've definitely uh, dampened my uh, Tuesday a little bit. <laughs> I had hope. I had hope for the human race, but. <laughs> No. Well, we've, we've survived so far. <laughs> so far, there's still time. Knock on wood, and uh, we'll we'll look for that to happen. But no, I think I think it's really interesting, and I, I love the lesson that you're teaching here. The story of when we suspend truth, when we start uh, going into reality. You know, we're, we're kind of entering a world lately where we've had this society that just kind of lives in a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. You know, we see it on Instagram. Uh, recently, TikToks. Uh, you know, I was just watching a video this morning where uh, the TikTok people have created a new filter that can make women look like uh, Victoria's Secret models with the filter that they have on them. Mm -hmm. And we, they already have a lot of catfishing that's going on already in the marketplace with that. Uh, and uh, people can create these whole fantasy lives. We've seen that in well, Instagram. It's, it's worse than you're saying. I, uh, mm -hmm. I think it was in today's paper, but that they have found a way to paste on the faces of, of, of um, real people, mm -hmm. uh, movie stars and so on, and um, make them into characters in a, in a porn movie. Wow. And, uh, uh, and, and technology is such that you really can't tell the difference anymore. So there you are mm -hmm. watching Scarlett Johansson in a hardcore porn film, even though she was never anywhere near it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the deep fakes, uh, even like the chat GPT that's coming out now. There, I guess there's a new version coming out. Uh, some people are saying they'll be able to write whole books within a, a very short matter of time that they can just have the computer do it for them. Uh, there's new versions of the new uh, art uh, uh, AI that's coming out where uh, it's it's 
able to create all sorts of fake images that you almost can't tell the difference anymore on. And uh, it, it kind of almost seems like we're in this world where everything's really going to be artificial and mm -hmm. the ability to tell if it's real or not. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what you what you're able to do, the Nuremberg trials and other trials that took place after World War II to bring these people to reality and uh, to punishment. You know, we're living in a world where things can get really out of hand if you really think about it. And people can create all sorts of, you know, thank God for, you know, with Donald Trump, there was the, you know, the fourth estate where they could take and and, uh, you know, people like Carol Linnigan, people could write about stuff and uh call it out you know other uh, we had so many great authors writing about the trump administration mm -hmm. they called out the the amount of lies uh you know at one point was it the washington post i think that was keeping a, a tally of all the yeah. lies that have been told yeah no it's very important I mean, uh, uh, unfortunately it's very hard to tell how much effect those things have it mm -hmm. would be a disaster if that didn't exist i mean it's absolutely essential that the the press does does try and um, uh, find the truth and 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 write about it or broadcast it but um uh, the, the the trump supporters to take the example of trump are not going to be very um excited about what goes on what what's written in the washington post or the new york times it just confirms to them and again as a result of a world in which people um, feel that there is no such thing as truth. Everything is partisan and everything is propaganda. Well, if if that's what you think, mm -hmm. then simply by because it, something is reported in the New York Times or the Washington Post, people will say, well, that's partisan. I mean, there's mm -hmm. no reason to believe that. That's, of course they would say that and so on. And th that's mm -hmm. the, another great danger of, of losing sight of the importance of, of truth. There you go. I mean, you know, even like the Fox News revelations through the Dominion uh, lawsuit where they've, mm -hmm. you know, they've they've got the texts and the emails of people going, yeah, we're faking it. Yeah, we don't. We're, we're selling BS. And, and and sadly, those people never make that connection or see the truth because Fox doesn't report it. That's all they watch. Yeah. It's really it's really interesting to me. Um, I remember back when the Trump administration was coming into play. And the fake news is really fake news. They had they had people that were just average dudes who started making these websites, and they at first they targeted Democrats, and they were feeding them, trying to feed them fake news through Facebook and social media and jacking the algorithm. And they found that a lot of Democrats would research and fact check stuff, and so then they played it to the Republicans and found that they would buy it and eat it up. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting, mm -hmm. just the mental game of it the why yeah. people choose and why people do what they do which is what you've studied in your book the collaborators mm -hmm. uh anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go um god i mean we've covered a lot of ground oh yeah um no i think we can leave it at that really there we go there we go <laughs> um so uh it's been wonderful to have you on the show ian and Thank see you. you again i'm glad you're doing well and we'll look forward to the next 41 books that you thanks very much <laughs> it's not 41 i think you're exaggerating but I, I'm but, taking uh, that off Amazon, so no, there may no, be some no, no, revision. No, I think uh, it's more like 14, I think. But Is it 14? Okay. Well, not 41, that's for sure. <laughs> I, uh, but I'm taking that from Amazon, so maybe okay. they've been the truth. You know, All those right. Amazon people over there. But I think those are for like revisions and maybe put in out in I other see. languages or something maybe. like that. And it may be counting like the Kindles and the audiobooks. That may oh, be what oh, well, that, in that case, maybe, yeah. Yeah, that's most likely what it's doing. So, but I, you know, I, I tried to pump you up and give you that, uh, that sort of. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, thank you for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Not at all. It was a pleasure. There you go. And thanks to Manus for tuning in. Be sure to pick it up wherever fine books are sold. But remember, stay out of those alleyway bookstores. They're kind of dangerous. And you might need a tetanus shot if you go into some of those alleyways and check it out. Order of the book wherever fine books are sold. The book is called The Collaborators, Three Stories of Deception and Survival in World War II. Came out March 7th, 2023. And we certainly appreciate you guys being here. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you next time. And that should have us out.